Well, what question from their kids do parents fear the most? I think I heard it. I think I heard it. Where do babies come from? Right? Where do babies come from? There are other candidates. Can I have the car tonight? Not good. I have nightmares about my daughter growing up to say, um, gee, Dad, why can't I marry Fred? He's paid his debt to society. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of things that could be bad. These are all bad. But if you're a math teacher, there is an even worse question, OK? And it's far more insidious than where do babies come from. So picture this, right? You're a math teacher. And you're at the board, and chalk's flying. You're proving theorems. It's all, the board includes all sorts of great, beautiful mathematics. And a hand goes up, and you think to yourself, oh my gosh, I am such a good math teacher that I'm sure this is a pretty significant little comment somebody's about to make, very in-depth in math. And the question becomes, um, are we ever really going to use this stuff? It's like a heart-piercing shot to your ego, if nothing else. And it's a good question. It's actually a pretty good question. Um, not one that we always answer very well. Um, sometimes we lie. We say, yeah, sure, you'll use this all the time. Um, sometimes we, a little more truthfully, but not very helpfully, well, if you become a you know, theoretical physicist, yeah, you'll use it all the time. Not wrong, but not very helpful. I think there's a much more helpful question, or I'm sorry, response to that question that you can ask, uh, that is asked, and that response is both more insightful and it applies to all students in any math class, and that is the answer to the question, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you use, ever use all this stuff, all these formulas, all these mathematical techniques, because this class is not about formulas and mathematical techniques. No math class is about formulas and mathematical techniques. They use them. This class, though, is about a way of thinking. A way of thinking. We live in a really complex and risky world. We live in a world that's characterized by interrelationships that are very difficult to understand. It's not a surprise, it's nothing new to say math is critical to the world. Math is critical to understanding the world and advancing the world in terms of science and technology. No problem. I think it's more than that, though. I believe that it's just as critical how we think about the world, that we need to think about the world in a mathematically sophisticated way, even if it doesn't ultimately involve formulas and equations, we still need to think about it a certain way, okay? Now, you're asking, Rick, what do you mean by a mathematical way of thinking? Well, okay, two examples. And it turns out, these are historical examples, it turns out they are both a matter of life and death, as it turned out, okay? Example one, Abraham Bolt was a mathematician, a Hungarian mathematician, who fled Europe right before World War II. And um, he came to New York, as, as a lot of uh, Europeans did at that time, and he joined the Statistical Research Group of Columbia University. This was basically a World War II think tank. And one of the projects he was asked to opine on uh, was, um, Abraham, help us to understand where we should put armor on Allied warplanes. Okay? These Allied warplanes were going out. They were going out on their missions, and they were coming back all shot up. They were coming back looking essentially something like this. I mean, there'd be bullet holes, anti-aircraft bullet holes in the fuselage, and in the wings, and in the tail. Interestingly, not so much in the engines, which were relatively undamaged. But the fuselage, the wings, the tails, all shot up. And the military wanted to understand how can we protect these planes better? Where should we put the, uh, uh, where, where optimally should we put the armor? Armor is important to protect critical parts of the plane, but it's also heavy. So you don't want too much armor, but you want it in the right places. And they wanted to know from Abraham Bald just what was the optimal location, fuselage, wings, tails, 
of this armor? And Vald replied, it was probably the sublime moment of his career when he, when he said this, he said, armor the, uh, armor, armor the engines, excuse me. And they responded, well, no, you didn't hear us. You didn't notice that in the data, we don't see planes coming back with holes in the engines. Bald said, <laughs> you're thinking about this wrong. He said, your data is incomplete. He said, it's not that you don't, it's not that engines are not getting hit. It's that when a plane gets hit in the engine, it crashes. It doesn't come back. You're not seeing planes with holes in their engines because when they're hitting the engines, they're destroyed. Tremendously insightful remark. Did not involve a single equation. It was a way of thinking about a problem. It was a way of questioning assumptions and understanding the context of the problem. Matter of fact, this is such an important issue in data uh, analysis that we have a word for it. It's called sur uh, survivorship bias. Okay? Sometimes data does not get to us because it hasn't survived to be observable by us. And that part of the data that was not directly observable turned out to be absolutely critical to understanding the essence of the problem and the essence around how best to armor and protect uh, a warplane. Example two, January 28th, 1986. It's a cold morning in Florida. The Challenger space shuttle launched. And about uh, 70 seconds, just a little over a minute after it launched, it, it exploded. All seven astronauts on board were killed. One of those astronauts was actually a civilian. Uh, if you're old enough to remember this, it was, it was terribly uh, uh, gut-wrenching. It was actually a, a civilian grade school uh, teacher. And so uh, uh, it was very uh, emotional. In the months after this accident, it was determined that the main reason, the main physical reason, that the shuttle exploded was because one of the rubber, uh, actually rubberish, silicon-ish, O-rings on one of the uh, uh, solid rocket boosters allowed gas to pass through. Now these O-rings are there to primarily prevent gas and propellant in the booster from escaping. Well, they failed and the, escape, the gas escaped, it was ignited, it further ignited the big fuel tank, and that's the end of the ball game. Okay? Now this, interestingly, was not a problem that anybody, you know, that, that everybody didn't already know about. They knew before this that it was possible that the O-rings would fail, they would become brittle when the weather was relatively cold, and that they could fail. In fact, they collected data on it. And in fact, they asked that very question that morning, should we launch or should we not? And they decided to go ahead because there was, excuse the air quotes, no clear evidence that there was a relationship between cold weather and potential O-ring failure. Here's a data set that they were looking at. At that time, seven, I'm sorry, 24 um, previous shuttle launches had gone off. Seven of those 24 showed some damage to the O-rings. Okay, after the launch, you can, you can check and, and see uh, uh, where the damage was. And they plotted those seven points against uh, temperature, higher, uh, lower to higher from left to right, and from bottom to top is the degree of O-ring damage. More damage is a higher point. And they plotted these O-ring damages in those seven shuttle launches versus temperature. And they looked at this and they said, eh, again, no clear evidence. We just can't, on the basis of this data, decide not to launch strictly because of our fear that O-ring damage may occur when the launch time temperature is relatively low. Just like Wald said in his World War II example, something's missing. The data is biased because, remember what I said, 24 previous launches, seven of them involved O-ring damage. What about the other 17? They didn't involve O-ring damage. 
turns out that that's an awfully important aspect to the overall context of the problem. Why don't we put those in? And there they all are. That's the other 17 points, okay? That's the 17 points that involve no O-ring damage, and with that in there, with those points in there, now you can clearly see that there is a relationship between temperature and potential O-ring damage. You could, as a good mathematician would, you could fit a curve or a line, and you could project what the potential for O-ring damage would be at the then current launch temperature on that morning in January 1986. It was 31 degrees when they launched. Okay? And there is the blue line that represents 31 degrees, and there's no question that the relationship this data is showing, when you include all the data, when the data is complete, it's going from lower right to upper left. There is a relationship, and a huge red flag was missed. Matter of fact, that 31 degrees was literally 22 degrees lower than any previous shuttle launch had occurred. So if they'd had even an inkling that this was, an, this was a, a real relationship, it really was possible that merely cold weather would lead to potential O-ring failure, huge red flag was missed at that time because they weren't looking at all the data. Okay. Well, there are two examples. Again, they both turned out to be a matter of life and death. We miss them not because we didn't appropriately use a formula or a mathematical technique, because of how we thought about the problem. And quite frankly, regardless, regardless of any of our mathematical background, we can all learn to think mathematically and think more precisely think more relevantly, think more insightfully. And we can do that by just doing three things. Challenge the assumptions. Identify what the underlying assumptions are for the particular problem we're, we're dealing with. And ask if they're appropriate. Ask if they're relevant. Ask, ask if they're correct. Appreciate the context. Always understand what the circumstances are within a problem and surrounding a problem. Nothing happens in a vacuum. And if that's the case, we better understand, if it's not a vacuum, we better understand what it does happen in. And third, understand the data. The data, where did it come from? What were the circumstances surrounding when did it emerge? Excuse me, emerged? Um, and just basically know if it's complete or incomplete. And if we can do that, and if we all can do that, again, it's not a matter of math is important. I, we all know that. It's the thinking in a mathematically sophisticated, logical, and insightful way that is absolutely critical and as critical as the ability to actually apply these formulas and these techniques. So students, any math class you take, yeah, if you remember, uh, in my classes, if you remember three things after the end of the class, you know, that's great, three formulas. But what I really want people to remember, and they won't even see it, to understand and to develop their way of thinking. And it's hard to pinpoint, it's hard to say, I just finished this class and it was really useful because I learned such and such. You don't. Think like that. You learn to think almost very subtly, very, um, uh, very under the surface. It's not the formulas. It's not the techniques that matter. It's how you go about thinking about problems. And boy, what a great world we will have if we can all just think more methodically and insightfully about the problems that we face in this very complex world. So thank you very much. <laughs>